Earth has a lot of water. Most of the planet's surface is covered with it, about 75% of the Earth. Uh, but less than 5% of that is fresh. And it's not always abundant where it's most needed. Uh, today, nearly 1 billion people in the world don't have access to fresh water. Yet we take it for granted, we waste it, we even pay too much to drink from it in little plastic bottles. I had a little argument with my wife because I was drinking tap water. Because soul water, soul water is supposed to be the cleanest in the world. Uh, Arisu. Uh, President Park also drinks it. Uh, but my, my, my mother-in-law, you should drink Arisu by the way, but my mother-in-law said we live in an apartment where the tanks aren't cleaned very often, so she said that I shouldn't drink the tap water, but most of you probably are safe. Okay? But water is a foundation for life. And yet there are far too many people spending their entire day searching for it. And today we have a water crisis. We have a water shortage. And of course, all of these things that's going on in the world have deeper spiritual meanings. We have a spiritual water crisis today. And today's passage, Israel found herself very thirsty in the wilderness wanderings. No sooner had they been delivered from the hand of Egypt, you know, they just got rescued from the hand of Egypt, and they face another crisis. They're thirsty. And this experience of the Jews and Moses with rocks has some spiritual lessons for us on a much de deeper level. Because the greatest thirst of all is not a thirst for water. The greatest thirst of all is a thirst for reality. And that reality is found in God. So we can take from this Old Testament experience four basic truths that you and I need if our lives are going to mean anything at all. So four points. First truth, truth number one. All of us have thirst that need to be satisfied. Let's say that together. All of us have thirst that need to be satisfied. As we read this Old Testament scripture today, as we read uh, Exodus, and you see the, mount, the march of Israel, the count of the marching of Israel, you look into a mirror. You're looking into a mirror. We're not reading ancient history, you know, what was that, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years ago, and saying, that's ancient history, that's the Israelites. We're reading contemporary current events, and we're saying, we. Okay? Every time you see the Israelites, you're going to look at them and say, we. This is about us. Because the Jewish people went through experiences that we go through. When you look at verse 3, but the people were thirsty for water there. That's us. Okay. There are people here today, perhaps at someone on church, who are hungry, and God, what does he do? He sends you manna from heaven. And some of you were thirsty, and God gave you water from the rock to quench your thirst. You see, you and I are reading our own story. We're just like these Jewish people. And there's nothing wrong with thirst. God didn't rebuke these people for being thirsty. You know, they were complaining. They could have asked nicely, but they didn't. But God didn't send thunder from heaven and lightning bolts and just open up the earth and swallow them up. No. When God made the first man, he made him with a need for water. And thirst is a good thing. If you didn't get thirsty, you wouldn't know that your body needed fluids. And if you didn't know your body needed fluids, you would die. And God built into all of us a thirst for water. And God built into all of us a hunger for food. It's a good thing when you get hungry. I'm actually pretty hungry right now. Uh, because hunger sends to you, send down some energy. Right? You can't keep working without energy. And God has built into us a thirst for other things, like success. Many of us, guys especially, have a thirst for success, love, meaning. And there's nothing wrong with success. He didn't build us to be failures. There's nothing wrong for desire for love. God said, it is not good for man to be alone, and I will make a helper suitable for him. And so love is a good thing. And all of these thirsts 
God has built into us. And everyone is thirsty for something. Now someone says, Pastor, aren't these things wrong? Nowhere does the Bible condemn human nature. These thirsts are all part of our human nature. The Bible, ne the Bible never condemns human nature. But what does it condemn? It condemns our fallen nature, our sinful nature. Okay. Nowhere does the Word of God say it's wrong to be hungry, it's wrong to be thirsty. Some of you have a desire for companionship. You know, at my old church, there's so many people, young people my age, who are lonely, and I was I relate. You know, I want to get married. Nothing wrong for that desire for companionship. It's nothing wrong with the desire for success. What it does say is, if you have a fallen nature, and if your fallen nature gets a hold of these desires, then you're going to have trouble. All of us have thirsts that need to be satisfied, and these thirsts are built into us. And God created us, this, created us this way. And when Jesus Christ became a man, he thirsted. He hungered. He knew what it meant to be tired. I'm speaking right now to some people who have some thirst that have not been satisfied. And now that leads us to the second truth that we learn from this event. First truth, all of us have, tru all of us have thirst that need to be satisfied. Truth number two, we cannot fully satisfy these thirsts ourselves. Let's say that together. We cannot, we cannot fully satisfy, satisfy these thirsts ourselves. ourselves. And so they cried out to the Lord. Uh, they, uh, verse 3, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? There's nothing they can do. And they had to cry out and get their thirst satisfied. And most of the problems in the world today are caused by people who are trying to satisfy their good desires in bad ways. Let me give you an illustration. There's certainly nothing wrong with companionship. Companionship is a great thing. You know, people want to have friends and people want to someday fall in love and get married. But there are people today who don't know the difference between popularity and character. And there are people today who think they're just they're going to satisfy their thirst down inside of friends and popularity. And they think they can do this by doing what the prodigal son did. You guys know the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. The son took his father's credit cards and his money and went off to a far country. And he had a lot of friends as long as the money was flowing and the parties were being held and the booze and him. But as soon as he was broke, he lost his friends. And he didn't know the difference between popularity and success. He didn't know the difference between re reputation and character. And I'm speaking to some people here who are trying to satisfy their good thirsts with cheap substitutes. This is why as you drive up and down the streets of Seoul, you hang your head in shame because there's so much sexuality spilling out over us in our culture today. You watch TV and there's just so much um, sex. Is there anything wrong for that desire of love that God has put in, into us in our human body? Is there anything wrong with that desire for love? Not at all, right? Of course not. God made man and God made woman and God didn't negate sex and God didn't close his eyes and say that's dirty, dirty. He provided normal ways for this to be expressed. He says there's a thirst down inside and here's the way it can be satisfied. What have people done? They've tried to satisfy this thirst in the wrong way. And consequently, we have the awful things that are going on today. Is there anything wrong with possessions? Ask yourself that. Is there anything wrong with possessions? Some of you have nice cars, nice homes. No, 1 Timothy 6.17 says, God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Then what's wrong? The, that thirst for possession can drive a person to envy and lying and stealing and murdering and covetousness. I mean, think about what war is. We have all these wars going on in Africa and the Middle East. And war on the international scale is no different from two little neighbor kids, two little kindergarten kids fighting over the sandbox. Okay? It's the same basic problem. God has given to us certain desires. 
All of us need it to be satisfied. But we can't fully satisfy these thirsts ourselves. Now, if there's one book in the Bible that spells these out in detail, it's the book of Ecclesiastes. You guys know Solomon. He gave us the book of Proverbs, and that, that's the wisdom of God. He gave us the Song of Songs, the love of God. But in Ecclesiastes, he looks at uh, life from a human point of view. And when you read Ecclesiastes, you see that Solomon's trying to find everything. He's thirsty for everything. He builds great buildings. He has a thirst for architecture. He plants beautiful gardens. He has a thirst for agriculture. But he's not satisfied. He studied all the philosophy. He has a thirst for knowledge, but he's not satisfied. He was the richest person in the world. He had a thirst for wealth, untold, but he's not satisfied. And in Ecclesiastes 1.8, he says this, All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. Isn't that interesting? Solomon, the richest man in the world, the wisest man in the world, and when he scans his great kingdom, he, you know, he has land... Um, that he can't, yeah. And when he sits down and he takes inventory on all that he possessed, he says, my eyes aren't satisfied. I've seen all these wonderful things. He's probably seen all the animals in the world. He's probably seen all the types of peoples in the world. And he still says, my eyes aren't satisfied. My ears. He's probably listened to some of the greatest musicians in the world. And he says, my ears aren't satisfied. He's probably listened to every book at the time. And he says, my ears aren't satisfied. So how are people trying to satisfy this thirst? With things? With thrills? With all the artificial achievements of our culture? And so far we've learned two truths. All of us have thirsts that need to be satisfied. And second truth, we cannot fully satisfy them ourselves. The tragedy is people are trying to satisfy their thirsts with substitutes. Which leads us to truth number three. Jesus Christ alone can fully satisfy us. Let's say that together. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ alone, alone can fully, can fully satisfy, us. satisfy us. Now, what is this deal about the rock, striking the rock, Moses taking a rod and striking the rock? What is this? Okay, Paul explains it to us. Okay, this picture here is a, a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, the New Testament in the New Testament explains this story for us. 1 Corinthians 10.3 He takes them through the experiences of Israel. He says, They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was... Fill in the blank. That rock was Christ. Okay. It's an Old Testament picture of a New Testament truth. That rock was Christ. What Moses is telling us and what Jesus is telling us and what Paul is telling us, that basic thirst down inside is a thirst for God. But we're all trying to treat the symptoms of it, but we never get down to the cause of our thirst. Think about this. Let me illustrate it this way. Would you go to a doctor who dealt only with symptoms and not the causes? Let's say you have a rash on your arms and your hands and you know it's all blotchy and red, it itches a lot. And you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hmm, I think it's caused by a bacterial infection in your blood. That looks very ugly. Here's what I'll do. I have some cosmetics here. I have some makeup. You know, let me just find some peach colored makeup and just cover that rash up with these beautiful cosmetics and you'll be, you'll be all right. You'll be worse off. Right? You see, a doctor doesn't simply deal with symptoms. He wants to deal with causes. And so he looks at you and says, Oh, you've got an infection in your blood. I have some medicine here. And he gets the needle and injects the medication. And the miracle drug goes to work. And the rash is cleared up. But that's what we do. We have these thirsts inside of us. So we treat them with Substitutes. We're just treating the symptoms. Okay? And the problem people are facing today is that they are living, and we are living, including myself, are living on substitutes. 
We have a thirst down inside. We have a thirst for power. We have a thirst for achievement, a thirst for love, a thirst for companionship, a thirst for success. And basically, it's a thirst for God. And if you find God, you have all of these things. And that's what the psalmist meant in Psalm 42 when he says, My soul thirsts after God. One day our Lord Jesus was at a well in Samaria, John 4, you guys probably heard the story, and he was all alone because his disciples had gone to buy some food, and a woman came to that well to get some water. She was thirsty, but she was thirsting for, uh, for something far deeper than the water of the well. Because she had been going through a number of marriages, she, was, uh, she got married five times, and she was on her fifth, sixth husband, she had a thirst down inside and she thought, and she had a thirst for love, which is a good thing, a thirst for companionship. And she thought she was going to satisfy this thirst by trying that and meeting this person and meeting this guy, making this change and plunging into that sin. And Jesus looked at her and said, the thirst that you really have is a thirst for living water. You've been drinking from the dead, polluted cisterns of this world and I can give you living water. And he did, and she drank of that living water, and she became a new woman. And Jesus tells a story about a man who was a wealthy man. Uh, nothing wrong with wealth, as long as you possess it, and the wealth doesn't possess you. Uh, this man had a beggar right outside. The beggar's name was Lazarus. Not the same Lazarus as Mary and Martha's brother. But this uh, beggar named Lazarus right outside his door. And the beggar, he just wanted some crumbs. He just wanted some of the rich man's crumbs that fell off the table. But the rich man didn't care much for him. He just ignored him. All that he cared for were, were his riches. And the Bible tells us that the rich man and Lazarus died. And the rich man woke up in hell. And do you know what he was? He was still thirsty. Okay? He cried out and said, please send somebody to bring water because I'm thirsty. Oh, but he was st thirsting in life. And if you thirst in this world, and you don't find your satisfaction in Christ, you're going to thirst in the next world. Hell is filled with people who are saying, I'm thirsty, I thirst. I'm thirsting for power, and I'll never get it. I'm thirsting for love, and I'll never find it. The only satisfaction we'll ever find is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone can satisfy our thirst. Now, why does Paul say that Jesus Christ is a rock? Why does he use that terminology? Why does he use that metaphor, a rock? You see, one of the great names for God in the Old Testament is he is our rock. What is a rock? A rock is a refuge. It's a strength. Think about if you're in a desert and there's a huge rock. Where are you going to find shade? You're going to find shade in the rock. And when you talk about a rock to an Old Testament Jew, the words that come up is stable, solid, eternal. You see, the Jewish people, they didn't like the sea. I love the ocean. One thing I don't, I, I lived in LA. I live five minutes away from the beach. Uh, I live in Seoul now. I'm so far away from the ocean. That's one thing I miss about being in LA. But the Jewish people, they didn't like the sea. Okay? They're not mariners. They're not sailors. Okay? The sea, whenever they talk about the sea, it was always a fearful, unknown thing. The Jews weren't too happy about the sea, but they liked to get their feet on a rock. Okay? Getting off that boat and stepping on firm land, that was solid to them. That was something that was appealing. They say, uh, Saul, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, unto the mountains. They like solid, firm land. And you see, God is a rock. And when Paul says, Jesus is a rock, do you know what he's saying? He's saying, Jesus is God. That's a quite that's quite a drastic statement to make, and because Jesus is God, He's able to satisfy all our needs, and because He became man, He knows what our needs are. Somebody here today is saying, Ah, Pastor Dan, he doesn't know what I'm going through today. He doesn't know what I went through this week, but Jesus knows what you're going through, and He's the Rock. Now, Jesus is the rock, and the water that came out of that rock is the Holy Spirit. That's the second part of today's passage, John chapter 7. 
uh, verse 39 explains that to us. And Jesus said that uh, on the last day of the feast, for seven days they had gone down to the pool and had brought water in a golden vessel and brought water back to the temple and they poured it out. And it was a remembrance. They were recalling this Exodus event. They were remembering that event when God provided water for them in the wilderness for the Jewish people. And the, when the ceremony was all finished and the water had been poured out, Jesus stood up and faced that crowd in the temple and he cried out and said, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And John adds a little parenthesis, an extra comment. By this, he meant the Spirit. You know, my friend, everything that the world is offering you is a substitute for what the Spirit can do for you. Our nation has an alcohol problem. You guys know this, and no one seems to... People seem to be proud of it. Like, oh my God, we're the biggest drinking nation in the world. I just read that Korea has the highest liquor consumption. So hard liquor, soju, okay, in the world. Twice as high as Russia. That's crazy, okay? Uh, do you know what the Bible says about alcohol? Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying don't, don't drink. If you drink beer, you drink in moderation, okay? Uh, but that's not the point of what I'm saying. The Holy it says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is all that we need. Okay? The Holy Spirit of God is that refreshing water that came from that rock. And they were thirsty people. And they had a right to be thirsty. They were human. But they were looking to some wrong way of satisfying their thirst. And look at verse 4. Exodus 17. What were they going to do? They were going to stone him. How is that going to help their thirst? Okay? They're crying out, give us some water, and then they just are going to kill the person who's going to give them the water. But, uh, and Moses took that staff, and he struck the rock. And do you know what that illustration is? You know, a lot of us are confused about the Old Testament. We're like, oh, what these things are? These are all pictures of something. They're foreshadowing something that happens in the New Testament. And in this case, when Moses took that staff, that same staff that he used to split the Nile River, or dip in the Nile River, turn his left, and he struck the rock. What is that a picture of? Striking the rock. Sorry? Moses? Yeah, I, I mean, but what is it a foreshadowing of in the future? Picture of Jesus, okay? Because as Moses stepped up and struck the rock, you know, the Old Testament people, they just thought, oh, there's an old man striking the rock. But in heaven, God and Jesus, and you have God the Son turning to God the Father, and said, one day, that is going to happen to me. One day, they will take me and nail me to a cross, and I will be struck with the rod of judgment. They will strike the shepherd. There's so many uh, prophecies, in Isaiah especially, about they will strike the rock, they will strike the shepherd. And Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for you and died for me that he might be able to forgive us and that he may be able to give us the Holy Spirit. And when the rock was struck, out came the water. And when Jesus died and went back to heaven, down came the rivers of the Holy Spirit. And I say, every thirst you have in your soul is satisfied by Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And that's why we Christians look with disdain on the cheap substitutes of this world because we've tasted of this living water. We've drunk deeply of the living water that Jesus died to provide. So we've learned three truths so far. All of us have truths that need to be satisfied, thirsts that need to be satisfied. We cannot fully satisfy them ourselves. Jesus Christ alone can fully satisfy, which leads us to our final truth. The fourth. In order to be satisfied, you have to drink. Let's say that. In order to be satisfied, you have to drink. John 7, 37 says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and what? Drink. And you're probably thinking, oh, pastor, tell me something complex to do. And I was thinking that as I was preparing the sermon, I was thinking, I need to give some three steps to drinking water or something. <laughs> no, drinking water is the easiest thing you can do. Here we are, two million Israelites are thirsty. And I can just see mothers picking up their little children, saying we don't have any malt water, but Moses will do something. And Moses strikes the rock, and rivers gush out. The water is just poured out. In other words, when God provides the Holy Spirit, 
When God provides you with the Holy Spirit, he doesn't measure the Holy Spirit out with an eyedropper. Okay? The rivers of water are abundant. Here are two million Jews, and the water was available for them, and the water was adequate, and the water was free and right there for them to drink. Anybody who died of thirst died at their own hands is because they didn't want to drink. Okay? Anybody who hears my voice today, who dies of spiritual thirst and wakes up someday and says, I thirst, you're dying by your own hand. In order to be satisfied, you must drink. And I trace this whole theme throughout the scriptures. The first time they were thirsty, what did Moses do? Moses struck the rock. The first, uh, second time they were thirsty, this is chap Numbers chapter 20. God said to Moses, what did he say? Numbers chapter 20, what did he say to do to the rock? Oh, just talk to the rock. Just speak to the rock. Okay? Because Jesus doesn't have to die over and over again. Okay? Jesus has to die once. Yet Moses, he didn't speak to the rock. He, he could have just said, you know, uh, rock, uh, pour out water. All he had to do is just speak to the rock. And instead he yelled at, he yelled at the people and it, he lost his temper and he struck the rock twice and ruined the whole picture. And as a consequence, he didn't glorify God and as a consequence, lost his inheritance into the promised land. But first you strike the rock, that's the death of Christ. And you drink of the water and you're saved. Then the next day you say, oh, I'm still thirsty. And you just come and you just speak to the rock. You just speak to Jesus Christ. Okay? And the water comes out and God provides what you need. And we Christians don't have to go around here and there looking for satisfaction. We just speak to the rock. And in the next chapter, uh, chapter uh, number Numbers 21, they dig a well. You see, the rock didn't chase them around. The rock just stays where it is. The rock's not following a yeah, pet rock. But the water followed them around. Okay? Wherever the nation of Israel went, the water was available. Okay? We stop in a little place. We need some water. Let's dig a well. We move on to another place. We need some water. Let's dig a well. And isn't that wonderful that God sent the water wherever they were? But there's something even more wonderful than that. You speak to the rock. Uh, the first, you strike, we don't strike the rock. The rock was struck, okay? You strike the rock. Second, you speak the, to the rock. Third, you dig the well. And when you get to the Gospel of John 4, you don't have to dig, dig any wells anymore. Right? I'll put, what does Jesus say? I'll put the well down inside of you. All of you have a well inside of you. That's a wonderful thing about being saved. Jesus said to her, Oh, if you knew the gift of God, and he would give you living water, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Every single one of us, has, if you're a Christian, has a well springing inside of us. And is this not true? Have you not discovered down inside of the believer is a spring? spring of living water that satisfies. And then in John 7, that well of water becomes a river of water. And why is it a river of water? Because we don't just drink it ourselves. And we have a river of water inside of us because we share it with other people because they're thirsty. In order to be satisfied, my friend, you have to drink. Do you know why people don't drink? They don't want to bow down. They don't want to get down on their knees to drink. In order to drink, you have to get down. You have to humble yourself. Some of you listening to me right now, you say, I'd love to have that living water. The only way to have this inward satisfaction is to come and drink. That's what it means to be saved. The last invitation in the Bible, Revelation 22:17, says this, let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. How is this a free gift? How is this water free for us? It's already been paid. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. At the very end of the Bible, God is saying, you're thirsty, come and drink, and I'll satisfy. I'll guarantee that you, if you keep drinking at the dirty cesspools of sin, you'll never satisfy. There's a, there's a pleasure of sin for a season, but that leads to the pain of sin for eternity. But if you'll come to the living waters that flow from the rock of ages, you'll always be satisfied. 
You and I have a thirst that must be satisfied. God wants you to enjoy the blessings of life and eternity. You can't satisfy these thirsts yourselves. If you deny them, you'll become a machine. If you live only for thirst, you become an animal. God wants you to be a man and be his child, his son, his daughter. All of us have thirsts that need to be satisfied and we can't fully satisfy themselves, them ourselves. Only Jesus Christ can fully satisfy them. But if you want to satisfy them, you have to drink. And drink, I encourage you, I exhort you to drink and discover how refreshing and wonderful it is to know Him. Let's pray. We come, our Father, with deep appreciation for the price that Jesus paid to satisfy the longings of our hearts. We're thankful that in Him we have reality. We don't have to have that which is artificial. We have that which is eternal. We're sorry, Lord, when we have tried to find satisfaction in sin. We're glad we have found satisfaction in Christ. Now for those who have never drunk, we pray may they come today and stoop and humble themselves and drink of that living water that flows from Calvary. This we pray with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.